Okay, and welcome back students who are taking math for business and finance and math applications. Um, this chapter here is chapter 15, the cost of home ownership. And this is a theory video. Um, I'm not sure whether this should be one or two videos, um, but we'll see. Now, there's really not much to cover here. As I had said at the end of the summary practice test uh, video, that when it comes to the cost of home ownership, this is very similar to uh, the previous chapter, chapter 14, which was installment buying. When we looked at installment buying, and let me go down to another uh, another slide here and scribble on it, okay? Um, when we were talking about installment buying, right, which is the previous chapter, you know, you had a purchase price, okay, and then you had a down payment, so then you had an amount financed, okay? And from that amount financed, you would figure out the finance charge or interest, okay? And when you add the two together, all right, that gave you uh, a total amount that you would end up paying a back, right? And from that, um, you if you divided it by the number of payments, you would know what your monthly payment would be. Okay, and that was basically what you know the previous chapter was about for installment buying. Right? Well, when it comes to a mortgage, and actually in that chapter, you know, I'd have a lot of a tendency to uh, refer to a mortgage, but installment buying meaning that you're paying back um, incrementally. All right, and and that equally applies to um, a mortgage. Why? Because you're paying, you know, you're borrowing, you know, an amount, you're getting, you know, you're having a fine, you know, you put down a down payment, you know, um, which means then you'd have uh, an amount that you're going to finance. I mean, basically the same exact thing here. And you have an interest rate, you know, times the interest rate. And that means you know how much you, you know, your total that you have to pay back. And you can calculate out the monthly payments from that. Okay, so really a mortgage, and I would oftentimes refer to it in the previous chapter, um, is basically the same thing as an installment payment. So this chapter is going to be relatively quick and easy. Um, uh, most of what you uh, will learn here in this theory or by reading a chapter is what we've already covered. And again, it's just, you know, concepts, okay? that you need to understand. The terminology may change, okay? For example, interest is the same thing as a finance charge, okay? Uh, you know, so the terminology may change and you have to pay attention to little idiosyncrasies and variables, um, you know, for the little changes, but Understanding the concepts is what's important, and as long as you're applying those, um, you'll do just fine. I mean, uh, everything that we've we've covered so far, really, you know, uh, there, you know, from my perspective, there isn't that much to learn for this particular chapter. Sure, I'm going to use a different table, okay? Um, you know, and that's pretty much just about it. Yeah, you know, um, la um, we're going to talk about an amortization table, right? But you use the amortization table the same as you used like a present value and the future value table from the previous chapters, okay? Whether it was a lump sum or an annuity, okay? Um, it doesn't matter which one you're looking at. They all work exactly the same way. They all function the same way. You're going to be looking up a factor and then multiplying somewhere along the line. So, you know, this, the, the concepts and the skill sets that you've developed over the previous chapters, it, this is just more of an application to a specific subject matter. Okay. So, like I said, this, um, this particular uh, chapter should go by relatively quickly. All right. So. Um, let's move on here to the types of mortgages. <clears throat> now, there's, you know, I'm no mortgage ex expert. You know, um, you know, currently I am uh, in the process of purchasing a, a home, okay, um, as I'm making these videos. So, 
um, I can lend a little bit of uh, some insight into the cost of home ownership and purchasing a home. Okay, um, but I'm you know no mortgage expert. All right. Um, I will tell you. I mean, as you read the chapter, you'll read about the subprime, um, and basically what the subprime was. You know, and we learned about. You know, we saw the effect of this between the years of 2000 and like five to uh, 2008. Okay, where basically anybody who can breathe, okay, the bank gave them a loan. Okay. Um, gave the, the person a loan on a home and the people moved in and they were, you know, were living well beyond their means. Why? Because, you know, let, let's say they, um, uh, let, let's say they were able to afford, and I'm just going to pick out a number here. Let's say they were able to afford a, a $600, uh, mortgage payment. Well, the bank, you know, you didn't need a, you really didn't need to qualify for the loan that much because of the way the banks repackaged those loans, and that's why they called them subprime, the operative portion, you know, being sub. And the bank would go to people and say, "Ah, oh, look at, you know, um, yeah, you you can qualify this loan as long as you have a job right now, and you know, uh, and you want your payment at six hundred dollars and you can afford it. That's just great." But what they didn't tell you was that um, it was a variable rate okay and what that meant was that as the interest rate goes up your payment was going to go up and if you can only afford six hundred dollars now you know at the percentage rate at that time and then all of a sudden the rate went up the, the interest rate went up well now your payment went up and it went up to 700 and it went up to 800 and people could not afford the payments anymore and then you saw you know, all of the foreclosures starting to hit, you know, in 2008. Right? So that's what, um, uh, that's what that, uh, the subprime was, was basically the people were just paying interest, okay? And as the interest rate went up, their payments went up. And then as a, as a double whammy, they were only paying interest, all right? A lot of people were only paying interest, and that was the full amount of $600. And then 10 years later, all right, they were required to then pay the interest and the principal. Okay, Well, if the people could only afford $600 and they bought a home that took up you know, $600 worth of interest, where are they getting the money to pay the, the principal from? They couldn't, and therefore a lot of people went into foreclosure. Okay, and as a matter of fact, um, you know, we, we kind of just passed that um, a lot of the foreclosures that uh, occurred because of the subprime, the subprime uh, lending at that time, which was um, basically uh, the banks, you know, just stealing from the poor. Okay, because they had no business. Um, uh, it, it's a two-edged sword. I mean, you have the bank here. The bank's purpose is to make money, and here you have this person, and you know they want a home, okay? And, but they have to be financially knowledgeable, okay? Have financial knowledge, okay? N O W L E. And you know, it's not you know. On one hand, you can say, well, isn't it the bank's moral responsibility to make sure that the people have you know? That they're they're not hurting the people. Well, the bank is in business to make money, okay, and it's the uh, people's responsibility to have that financial knowledge. But they were kind of like sticking their head in the sand and absolving themselves from any of that financial knowledge. And you know, because the bank isn't morally bound to protect the the person, they made the loans, okay, knowing full well that that person down the road would not be able to pay back that mortgage and so what ended up happening is is the bank now gets the houses you know they get those assets plus the money that was paid in okay because remember here was a here's a house and somebody owns that house and they want to sell it to you okay well when they sell it to you you're gonna borrow the money and you're borrowing the money from the bank right now, let's say that house, to make things simple, 
was free and clear, meaning there was no liens, no mortgage on it, you know, it was totally paid off. So now all of a sudden this person is borrowing money from the bank, so the bank is getting money in interest. Okay. And then down the down the road, when they foreclose on the house, they also get the house, right? So now the bank owns the interest that was paid in and the house and the people, well, they're still left in the street, okay? So, you know, that's a, a bygone thing right, right at this moment in time with the exception, all right? And I'm going to bring that up between um, two, not only did they do this against um, the, you know, use it as subprime, but between 2005 and 2008, they had what was called a home equity line of credit. So here's the person that had this house, right? And the, the house was completely paid off. And let's say there was $100,000 of equity in that property, okay? Well, um, what, what they did was, was they said, okay, look at Mr. Homeowner, you can take um, and borrow against the house on a line of credit. And you can borrow out, you know, the $100,000. So people would borrow out the $100,000 $100, in order to go on vacations and, um, you know, pay for college and buy a new car and this kind of stuff. And the thing about it is that these lines of credit the way a line of credit works is, is that interest gets paid first, okay? And the catch was, since it's the home equity line of credit backed by the house, they said, oh, okay, you don't need to pay back the principal for during the course of the first 10 years, okay? All you need to pay is just the interest. So starting it next year in 2016, which is 10 years later, all the way through 2019, what's going to happen is, is all these people borrowed this $100,000 and they have, I'm just going to make up a number here, $700 payments, okay? Um, you know, and they, they're only paying back the interest. And now come, you know, 10 years later, come 2016, Again, they're going to have to pay the principal, which means now, instead of $700, they're going to uh, need to owe $1,200 a month. And a lot of people are not going to be able to afford it. My understanding is, is that 3.8 million uh, of these loans were made all right, during that period of time. And they fully expect half of them that the people will not be able to afford to pay back. And what does that mean? Well, we're back to the same issue as the subprime. The bank is not only getting that interest for the 10 years, right? But um, they're going to end up foreclosing on the houses, okay? And they're going to get those people who at one point in time own their house free and clear. And they're sitting there saying, I'm old. I'm going to retire. I don't have to worry about my house. You know, I'm going to have a place to live. Uh, the houses are going to get taken away from them. You know, you're, you're talking in the neighborhood of 2 million people, okay, um, are going to be homeless or without a home. So what's going to happen to them? They're going to get kicked out of their house and they're going to have to go rent, okay? Whereas just because of poor financial knowledge, um, they're, you know, find themselves upside down. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to stop here, and uh, since I took a lot of time on the subprime, but this is just a, a little bit of an extra that uh, you're not finding in the textbook that I know about. So I'll see you in the next video.